If you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. So as you find your way to some notes, a pen, uh, open an app on your phone that you can jot stuff down. The title of this message is Man-Made Wilderness. Man-Made Wilderness. I know some of you might object to the notion of such a thing on the basis of that being an oxymoron. You're like, nope, I refuse. If it's made by man, it's not a wilderness. Well, that's fine, uh, but that's the title. So you can't do anything about that. Uh, the series we're in currently is called Morning, Noon, and Night. And if you missed the kickoff message, uh, I would encourage you to jump on our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Fresh Life Church or on our podcast or app uh, because we preach uh, these series most often as one message broken up over a number of weeks as opposed to like a part two, three, and four. And so really last week set the pace for everything in this, in this collection of talks. So we'd love to have you hear that. It was called Helter Skelter. So and it was what we want to avoid, lives of ah, pulled in a million di different directions, because that's not good for your soul. And this series is all about the rhythms of a healthy soul. We want to come to a place where we get into a rhythm with something that's good for us on the inside. Because if, if where you're at is a place where you're not healthy, where there's dysfunction, but you look to the future, you go, oh, it'll be better down the road. Uh, let me tell you something. If you don't change your direction, you're going to arrive exactly where you're going. Yeah. So where you're at today, play that out. Just fast forward the tape 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you'll be even more unhealthy. You'll be even, you'll be even more uh, dysfunctional. And so what we want to do is currently assess where we're at and, and play that out and make the necessary changes, course adjustments. I mean, two, three degrees out, flying from LA to New York, you are way off course, just two degrees. So let's fine tune it and say, look, are we at a place where our souls are in a healthy, sustainable, scalable rhythm. And if not, let's do something about that. Let's tweak the formula, because bad days make for bad months, make for bad years, make for bad decades. And, and so let's make the changes we need to now. Let's not live helter skelter. A good rhythm for your soul, morning and noon and night. Let's have good days and build them together, string them together like a string of pearls. And, one day we'll look back and be proud of, of, of the life that we've been living. Stephen Covey once said, you could, you could spend your whole life climbing a ladder yeah. and get to the end of your life and realize your ladder was propped up against the wrong wall. Yeah. And the greatest tragedy would be to win in life at the wrong thing. Yeah. And so let's figure this out, shall we? Yeah. Um, and I'm admittedly in this, in this series just I'm preaching to myself, I always am, I'm preaching to myself more than I'm preaching to anybody. So this isn't me up here like, hey, you people, this is, this is us. This is, this is us. And let's make sense of it while we still have breath in our lungs. Mark 1, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, casual, He's coming up out of the water. Heaven just got torn open. I know you had a good baptism experience. His was better. <laughs> Heaven's torn open? Well, it, just wait. It gets weirder. And the spirit descending on him like a dove. Someone just say awesome quick before my head explodes. <laughs> and a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the desert. Underline that. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals. And then angels attended him. Well, of course they did. <laughs> I know you guys are just reading this like it's no big deal. Like, that, that's something that you've been through a thousand times. You're like, yeah, of course. The Holy Spirit descended on him. And then the Spirit drove him into the desert. And that was when the angels were there. No, no, no. Was that before the animals were with him? No, animals were with him. And then the angels came to him. But I've always had a hard time with this, trying to make sense of it all. Why did the Spirit lead Jesus into the desert? Because didn't Jesus tell us to pray, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one? So, so what's this all about? The Spirit sends him into the desert. 
And when he gets there, he's like, well, why do I got to go? The baptism was great. It was awesome. Don't just go, you get somewhere to be. OK, OK, all right, I'll go. And then he, he gets into the desert, and the devil's there. And he's like, he look, looks to go. The spirit's gone. The door's been shut. He's like, ah, now I'm in a cage match with the devil. He was tricked into a cage match with the devil that lasted over a month. And now he's here in, in hand-to-hand combat with the enemy. What, what is this, like some sort of Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail? You must pass these three trials, or you're not worthy to sit from this chalice, right? Only the penitent shall pass. OK, if you can survive 40 days in the desert, and then you can handle the devil telling you this. And then, because we don't read it in Mark's gospel, because he's the concise gospel. Someone call, he, called Mark the and then gospel, because one of the most common phrases that you're going to read when you read Mark's gospel is and then. He's like, and then Jesus did this. Oh, 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 and then Jesus did that, right? He, this whole thing, he never gets to turning bread and, out of rocks and jumping off the temple and angels catching you and you know, bow down and worship me, and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. He never got to any of that. Because he's like, oh, and then guess what happened? All right? And he's just like jumps around from thing to thing. It's not even his information. He interviewed Peter. And Peter's information is what we have in Mark's gospel. But if we were to read the other accounts, we would see the devil bringing these three challenges to him. And I've always read it, and I've even heard it taught that this wilderness testing was like some sort of strenuous, grueling, Spartan challenge. And if Jesus could make it through the 40 days, if he could succeed where the first Adam failed, that's how we've always heard it. And Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus is the one who would step into a desolate wilderness where Adam was in a perfect circumstance, a flourishing garden, leaves everywhere, trees full of fruit. Everybody was happy, naked and unashamed. But even in that idyllic situation, Adam fumbled. Adam fell. So Jesus was going to come into the anti-Eden, this desert, this bad land. He was in the elephant's graveyard, right? He wasn't even supposed to be there, right? And, And yet, even here, as the devil brought the, the fruit to him. Jesus was unwilling to eat that forbidden fruit. Actually, it was, it was forbidden carbs. Now, I would have a hard time with that. I'm just going to be honest with you. Fruit, I could take or I could leave. But you give me some hot bread. You get some balsamic and some olive oil. You get some rosemary on the top. It comes out. I love me some bread like at the macaroni grill. Like I kind of secretly like it when they forget to bring the bread out at an Italian restaurant. I'm like, I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> Oh, God, I want bread so bad. And they're like, did you want some bread? Yes, please. Just, just r- let me rub it on my face. Is that OK? Is that weird? Too much information early in the service? So, so Jesus like turned down the carpet, all that. And, it, and how I've always kind of seen it is that if he didn't handle the hardship of the desert, then he wasn't even worthy to go on to the challenge of the devil coming at him. And so I picture Jesus kind of like curled up in a ball, you know, kind of like, oh, oh, it's only my imagination. It's only my imagination, like Kevin McAllister in the basement. And he's there in the wilderness. And he sort of hates it all. And it's so horrible. And it's getting him weaker and weaker and weaker. And at the 40-day mark, he's so weak. And the devil shows up. And he's barely hanging on. But he manages somehow to rally himself like Rocky Balboa. And his eyes all puffed up. And he's all hurt. And he's emaciated and sick. But still, somehow, he prevails. And he came out of the, and it was like, dun, 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 dun. And, <laughs> and that all presupposes one fallacy, that Jesus did not like the wilderness. That he somehow found it distasteful to be there. And, and if that's the case, then the rest of the gospel accounts don't make much sense. Like, what are you going to do with Mark chapter 1, verse 35, which says this? Look at it on the screen. Jesus, throughout his life, would rise up early in the morning when it was still dark out and depart by himself and go out to desolate places. Same idea in the original language, wilderness places. And there he would pray. You have a little bit of time before the day begins. What are you going to do? I want to be in the wilderness. Mornings. He would hang out there. Oh, we're also told this is Matthew's gospel, 14, verse 23. After he dismissed the crowds, he went up. This is after a hard day work. He would go up to the mountains by himself to pray. When evening came, he was in a wilderness place by himself. Spirit not leading him that we read about. This isn't being pushed to some horrible challenge. This is him of his volition after a crazy day work realizing, I'm depleted. I'm pretty spent. You know what I need? It's going to reinvigorate me? The wilderness. And it wasn't just mornings 
and night see there. Because Luke's gospel tells us, Luke 5, verse 16, Jesus would often withdraw to lonely places where he could pray. So the idea is not that this is somehow some awful thing, but Jesus endured it. And this wasn't Jesus being forced to a place of weakness. This was Jesus being led to a place of strength. What I'm trying to get you to see is that the Spirit didn't lead Jesus into the wilderness because, or so he could be tempted. The Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness because he was going to be tempted. This temptation's coming. This hard thing's coming. You're, you have this whole huge ministry about to begin. There's going to be all of this three and a half year hardship you need to start it off with a full tank. And so the wilderness is going to be where you're going to get your tank full, where you're going to be strong, and you'll be able to handle all that's to come. What I'm trying to get you to see, and we're going to put it on the screen, is that the Jesus overcoming the temptation wasn't made more difficult by his time in the wilderness. It was possible because of his time in the wilderness. It was only possible to withstand all that was about to come because he was willing to first endure this time of being alone with the Father and to do so in a desolate place. You have to understand, this isn't uh, torture for Jesus 40 days there. This is tactics for Jesus 40 days there. Tactics. This, this to Jesus isn't somehow some sort of strenuous thing. This was a strategy that he employed. And, and I think what that means for you and for me is to assess our lives and to ask the question, with all this in front of us, how can we be like Jesus and make sure that we, as men, would follow in the footsteps of the Son of Man and we would make our way to the wilderness. This man made his way to the wilderness. Man made wilderness. And we need to do the same if we're to be at our best when the enemy comes to us, that when the enemy meets us, that we've done what Jesus did. You can't change the battle, but you can change the battlefield. And Jesus is saying, if the devil's coming, if the, if the Lucifer himself is going to show up. Now, sidebar, most of us have never, ever had any experience with the devil. I know we're like, the devil made me do it, and the devil's been messing with me. The devil probably does not know my name and probably does not know your name, OK? He's um, not omnipresent. He's not in one, more than one place at one time. He has lots of demons. And I probably have like a JV demon who's got an inhaler, OK? <laughs> and he causes enough problem for me, all right? But, but the devil personally showed up. And we know that he, the Bible even indicates that demons are assigned to different jurisdictions, different areas. There's, there's principalities of area, like a Vegas or a New Orleans or a New York City. There are demons, Prince of Persia. There are demons assigned to locales and spaces. But you know what? Angels are assigned too. And just like the angels showed up for Jesus, God will send his angels to watch out for you. <clears throat> and he'll do the same for me. The, the, the notion of a guardian angel is by no means unbiblical, OK? And, and we should, as parents, be praying God would send his angels to watch over our children and, and do so and protect them, OK? So, so Jesus here is, is getting strong by being in the wilderness. Why? Because there he found quiet. And we need that as well. We talked last week, if you missed the message, about how really the heartbeat behind this healthy soul thing is to come to a place where we know how to calm and quiet our souls. David said that. I have learned to calm and to quiet my soul. If you don't quiet your soul, you won't have a quiet soul. Because we live in a very loud world. We live in a world that's anything but calm, anything but quiet. We live in a world that is so loud. Jim Collins said we live in a cacophonous age cacophonous age full of swarming insects, of noise and interruption, buzzing about emails, text messages, cable news, advertisements, cell phones, meetings, wireless web connections, social media posts. We run the risk, he says, of waking up at the end of the year, having accomplished little of significance, each year slipping by in a flurry of activity pointing nowhere. Please stop and say, ouch. ouch. A flurry of activity. Well, we're busy. We are so busy. We are so, a flurry of activity pointing nowhere. But leaders can. And then Jim Collins, boy, indeed, must be disciplined people who create the quiet space for disciplined thought and summon the strength for disciplined action. 
Jesus, the master leader. Point me to a better leader than Jesus. Point me to a better people person than Jesus. He is cre- Why is he in the wilderness for 40 days? He's listening to the spirit who's calling him into a season of creating space for disciplined thought, for remembering who he is, to summon himself. So the devil shows up. I love this. I love this thought. The devil shows up finally. He's like, hey, you should. And boom. And Jesus has an answer for every attack. And his attack is blistering. I was like, hey, have you seen those stones? So wouldn't they be good bread? You're probably hungry. He's like, fool, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. We learned that on day six. Day six of the wilderness, Father and I were talking about that. He's like, oh, good point. OK, OK, take him to a high place. Throw yourself down in the angels. The angels? Yeah, the angels are there. But guess what? I'm not putting my Lord, Lord my God, to the test. So he could get me, but he's got me here. In fact, he called me to be here. What you got next? That was like, oh, this fool's been preparing himself. <laughs> Bow down and worship me. All the kingdoms of the world are yours, right? You don't have to go to the cross. What are you talking about, Willis, right? He's saying, man shall not worship anybody but the Lord my God. What you got? The devil bounced. The Bible says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. A lot of us think there's some truth to the Oscar Wilde statement. The only way to get rid of temptation is to give in to it. No, you resist temptation, the devil will flee from you. And so that's what happens here. But Jesus had the strength because he had created the space for the kind of thought and self-reflection and self-awareness and set being, he was centered. This was a man centered and anchored. In the wilderness, he was not depleted. He was energized. His soul was in a good rhythm, so he was ready for what would come next. And we need the same if we're not to forfeit all of our peace. Now, before we go any further, let's just acknowledge the times that we're living in. Let's just acknowledge, if we've made a mess of ourselves, it's not for no reason, right? We, we didn't know what was happening as the world changed all around us. 2007 is when it really all started to happen. 2007 is when the iPhone was invented. Steve Jobs held it up for the first time. This is the iPhone. And now we're all going to have infinity in our pocket. In all of recorded history, no one's ever had infinity in their pocket. If you give a 13-year-old a car with no instruction, if you give a 13-year-old access, what are they going to do? Make a mess. I made a mess. Well, of course, you were handed a car without instruction. You weren't ready for it. We we have infinity in our purses. We have infinity. All of Wikipedia, every bit of knowledge there's ever been. The ability to have ceaseless communication and input coming at you all the time. And I'm not just talking about the negative stuff. We talked last week about the Netflix stuff and the Instagram stuff a little bit. But now let's just talk about, about, for, for about the positive stuff, the TED Talks, the YouTube lectures, the college courses, uh, audio that you can just audit and just be listening to, the next wicked awesome Brene Brown talk. What the audible from, from Seth Godin? Oh my gosh, Seth Godin. What Tim Ferriss's podcast? That guy, are you kidding me? So productive. And I got a Bluetooth speaker in my shower. There's, it's waterproof. That used to be like the one sacred time. Now you have a shower. We have Bluetooth speakers in our shower now, guys, right? You can't, you, you, you could live a life that you have so optimized and tweaked and hacked that you are efficient, you've cut the fat away, that you are constantly, ceaselessly receiving good things, good inputs. And let's say you're not on Instagram and you're not on, 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 on Netflix too much. You've limited those things. But now it's just good stuff. This is a sermon podcast. It's the Beth Moore thing. It's, just, it's, it's Hillsong United's new record. It's Fresh Life Worship. Dawn is coming. You could be having input coming in all the time and have no quiet. It's possible, in a way it never was before in the history of the world, to banish quiet from your existence. From the moment you wake up until the moment you fall asleep with your phone in your hand, I know someone who can't sleep without ESPN on, real low, low, low volume. Can't sleep without sports. It's just in the background. I just need a little noise to help me sleep. It's never in the history of humanity been possible like it to have such incredible, complex inputs coming in all the time. And Twitter, Twitter, 2007 was when Twitter went mainstream, by the way. Invented in 2006. That's when I signed up for my account. But in 2007, South by Southwest, it went like a wildfire around the world. 2007, 
was also when Facebook opened up from just being a college website to being anybody that has an email address can now all of a sudden have this digital community. All of a sudden, infinity is in our pocket. We can communicate with everybody all the time. And we never have to stop taking in if we don't want to. 2007, the world changed. It's also when Fresh Life was started. <laughs> but three of the four things that I mentioned are capable of bringing you to a place where there's no longer any free moments to think. No longer any quiet spots to ponder. One author, he said, it used to be if your flight across the country uh, was longer than your book was, you would just look out the window and stare. But now we have a seven-inch screen in our phone, in a our, in our, in our headrest. We're not going to get rest because there's something in the headrest. Okay. And there's Wi-Fi, too, which we complain about. It's so slow. Oh, that Wi-Fi on that flight was brutal, savage. Don't even know how I lived. <laughs> Mm. You know, it used to be you put a tie on and just sit there and look out the window. And, and now we're all in sweatpants, and many of you are not wearing deodorant. And, <laughs> and we're like, the internet, bleh. right? What, like, what has happened? And what have we given up? Because Jesus said, it's possible to gain the World Wide Web, but lose your soul. One translation says you can lose touch with your very self. That's what happens. We lose touch with, with who ourselves. Who are we? We don't have a moment to think. I also unearthed that, and this is in Cal Newport's book, which I referenced last week as well, Digital Minimalism. Uh, he talks about how uh, your brain, when receiving information, like a TED Talk or like a podcast or like a book on Audible, it cannot disengage the social side of who you are. There's a social side of you. And so what happens is you're, you're hearing Seth Godin talk, uh, but you, part of you, the social side of you, thinks it's a friend speaking to you. So you're taking in the content, but you feel like you're having a, a moment with Seth. That's why I get, I get letters from people who read my books, and they're like, I feel like I know you. you just, there's such a moment. It's because they, they felt like they were socially with me when they were listening to me uh, read, read my book to them. But let me tell you something. I, I was in a little studio in Nashville. I'm not, I was not in your car with you. We're not having a social moment in that experience. It's not social. So the tragic side of that is you can feel fatigue and overload of the social side of you. So when you live that way, you're less likely to want to engage in actual face-to-face -face relationships because you feel like you've, you party is like, I feel like I'm already, I need some alone time. I've already had so much time with, with people, but you haven't. And the tragedy is that, guess what? Malcolm Gladwell's not coming to the hospital when your kid is in the emergency room. And, and Tim Ferriss does not know your garage code and is not going to be there for you when, God forbid, the worst happens and the text messages are firing around. Here's what happened. Here's the hospital. Here's what the doctors are saying right now. And the surgery is supposed to be over for three hours. You will know more soon. And you know what? Uh, Nancy Lee DeMoss is phenomenal, and so is Beth Moore, and so is Christine Kane. But they're not going to be there for you like your small group will. And if you're so taxed socially from what you're taking in in your self-development life hack way, you'll be too exhausted to develop the rhythms of relationship that are going to be there to sustain you in a necessary and life-giving way should, God forbid, your life go off the rails. And so what, 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 are we, what are we giving up when we give up quiet? What are we giving up when we give up being just solitary for a moment? Not like the card game, <laughs> right? <laughs> solitary, solitude, right? These are, these, are, these are things that have been lost in our nonstop cycle where we have, we're, we're expected to know everything. Someone says, did you know what happened? I'm like, I didn't know what happened. You, you aren't watching news? No, God, no, heaven, no, I'm not watching the news, right? I've carefully selected times when I will let news into my life. You know what? I'd love to tell you about the news of how me and Jenny are doing, because we had a great date this week. I can tell you about how Olivia and I are doing, my oldest daughter, because she's going to be out of the house in just a couple years. And guess what? We had a wonderful time this week. I, I had a great daddy-daughter date with Daisy. We had so much fun. I caught up with her. So I don't want 24-7 news coming into my head. I don't want nonstop audible coming to my head. I'm going to listen to some books. I'm going to do something. But I'm going to find time in my life. I'm going to make my own wilderness. It's, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make my own wilderness. And you can, too. It doesn't matter if you live in the middle of Yellowstone National Park and you're listening to this, you're like, it's so easy. I go outside. Now, you know what? You can, you can go into an actual wilderness but not be in one. 
You can be in an Uber in the heart of Manhattan, but be in your own little bubble. This is my time. My phone's going away. I'm putting this thing on airplane mode, which does work, by the way. And I'm going to put my soul into airplane mode. I'm just going to breathe. And you're like, this is so common. This is in every book right now. It's called mindfulness. Yeah, but that's just, that's just being, uh, that's quiet time without Jesus is what that is, right? Yeah. So, so this, is, this is what the world's saying we need. But we're just realizing that God who made us told us this before the world ever figured it out. Right. To be alone, to be still. These are things that we all need to do. Make our way to the wilderness. Because without it, we'll be anxious. Without it, we are anxious. You know, Barnes & Noble reported a 25% year-over-year increase in demand for books on anxiety. 25% increase. According to the American Psychological Association, teenagers in North America today are living with levels of anxiety that were normative in psychiatric patients in the 1950s. It's teenagers today. We're left with a smoldering sense of anxiety. We're bored. We're listless. Why? We're feeling bored, not because there's nothing to do, but because there's too much to do. And we're not ever bored. We're bored because we don't ever allow ourselves to get bored. Right. And the moment it's still, we turn some music on. The moment it's still, we have to have something going on at all times. Some, oh, text this friend, text this thing, check the notifications on the Amazon. Da, 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 da. Why? Why? Why are we in the movie theater? Why am I in the movie theater watching a 38-foot tall screen, but I need to know what's on my little phone? I'm looking at a little screen, because I see this person over here did it. There's an announcement. He didn't listen. Well, I can just quickly, as long as I'm not the only one, I can qu Why do I care about this device? I've, I've paid to sit in front of this screen. Why am I watching Netflix, but also on this, and have my laptop over here? I'm bored. I'm listless. I, I feel burnt out. I'm not at my best when I'm allowing nonstop noise into my life. And then when I go back to work, I'm not as productive. We talked last week. It's the University of California data. 23 minutes and 15 seconds is how long it takes for you to re-engage on a deep level with a project after you've been distracted. Have you ever felt like annoyed with a book because it was too slow? It's a book. I've loved reading my entire life. I used to do contests at the local library uh, in the summer, how many books you could finish in the summer. I won like three years. They're not bragging, but you know. <laughs> And I've loved my whole life to read. But I notice that when, when I get to that place of overwhelm and overload, I actually pick up a book, but I, I find my eyes are just wanting to scan or wanting to jump around. I'm like annoyed, and I'm having a hard time engaging with the book. Yeah. Now, it's possible to, uh, to deep read on the internet. And it's possible to skim a book. But that's not what the two mediums lend themselves to. Yeah. The, the internet medium lends itself to shallow. So when you're getting that dopamine hit of distraction, you're getting that same thing from the slot machine arm or from a hit of, of drugs, that, that in uh, the internet is, is brought into you, you're, 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 you tend to bounce around. You tend to think, oh, I got to go to this other page. I'm not going to finish this whole talk. I'll, I'll jump over to this other thing, where a book is, is meant for that slow, and it takes work to settle into that. So we have to choose to do what Jesus did, follow the Spirit into the wilderness. Can I give you three tips? Then we're done. We're, we are almost over. You're, you're almost at lunch. All right, but just quick three things. When you create wilderness for yourself, do so in motion. And then we're going to talk about how you got to do so in nature. And then you got to do so in silence. So these are three intentional things. Let's start with in motion. How did Jesus get from his baptism at the river to this desert area in between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea? Answer, he walked. And that was a part of the process. The part of the process of him slowing. The part of the process of him doing what is employed all throughout the Bible as an analogy for a relationship with God. It's walking. That's, that's the thing. It's, it's walking. When you, when you walk, your arms swing. When you walk, you tend to start breathing a little bit deeper. When you walk, something happens to you. It's really good for you. Eugene Peterson, uh, who went to heaven this past year, who was such a man of God. And he gave us a translation of the Bible called The Message. And just, just a dear saint, had the chance to sit down with him, uh, was one of the last visitors he took before his health took a turn. Uh, they combed through his 
library and found extracts of some of his sermons that he had preached uh, throughout his ministry that were never before published. And uh, they are going to be releasing this year in a book called A Month of Sundays. And they sent me an advanced copy. And I love this one thing he said so much. He said, the virtual elimination of walking by the automobile has more than physical consequences, for it also diminishes spiritual perceptions. We get places faster, but we experience less. So just finding time in your life that you're choosing, OK, this is a moment for solitude. This is a moment for me to walk somewhere. This is a moment for me to, to pay attention to birds. Like, like, like I love to do this even when I'm traveling. And whenever I fly through Atlanta, I uh, ignore the plane train. Atlanta is the busiest, largest airport in our country. And I think it's a, the most takeoff and landings in the entire world. And so it's massive. And so there's a huge train that can get you from, from all the different terminals. And if you don't take it, it's a 25-minute walk in some cases. And I love it. It is me time. If I have the luxury, meaning I don't have a quick uh, turnover, I will always walk that. And it's like it's a beautiful thing to, to watch people hurrying, 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 and just be like, I'm leisure. I'm just walking here. So even in a situation like that, I can find some time for there to be that quiet. Do so in motion. Thoreau said, look at this, whenever my legs begin to move, my thoughts begin to flow. And you'll find that like so many great leaders throughout history, you know, Dwight D. Eisenhower would take walks alone. That's how he planned out the D-Day invasion. Steve Jobs was prolific for his walking. He wouldn't have business meetings. He would have business walkings. He'd have people meet him, and they'd just go walk around Palo Alto. They would just take a walk together, and that was where the ideas, the juices began to flow. This is, this is such a, a great time for ideation. But let me give you some pro tip. Leave your phone behind. I won't use it. It'll be there. You'll use it. You'll know it's there. You'll, you'll need to touch it. You'll think about it. You'll pet it longingly through your denim, right? You know what I do? Because they're like, oh, what if I have a great idea? You could use a pencil and a paper. It's crazy. It's the craziest thing you've ever said, Lusco, right? What does that even mean? I throw a little pen, pencil and paper. I have, I have outlined chapters to books. I have written whole sermons. I have had Jesus speak the tenderest things to me. Sometimes he just whispers, it's going to be OK. Wow. Wow. It's going to be OK. It's going to be OK. I take these walks. This is how I work my way through grief. This is how I worked my way through uh, all, the, every hard season. Every hard season we faced at Fresh Life, the one this week. I took a walk, and God whispers to me, and I'm still. And sometimes I just say, I don't know, like long prayers. Sometimes it's just Jesus. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And that's enough. And there's the space to breathe. And sometimes it's, it's all I can do to make it without crying. And other times, it's, I feel like a dance inside my heart. But something is, 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 is set on fire, some steel. And I always, always, always get back different than I came. Yeah. Find your, your time like Jesus did and do it walking. Secondly, in nature, this area, I've been there. It is cool. I mean, no, it's actually not cool. It's, it's hot, but it's really beautiful. That's what I meant by cool. And, and it's like uh, the Dead Sea is the lowest point on Earth. And so you have these extreme you know, fluctuations. And it can get cold at night because it's desert. But during the day, it's scorching hot. And there's craggy rocks. And, and, and it's just beautiful. It's deadly, but it's beautiful. And so to think of Jesus there, I could see him settling in. I, I love it. I, little thing about me, uh, you, it cannot get hot enough for me. God has a sense of humor. <laughs> when, when we get like our 300 plus days of the year and we have not had one yet, I'm like the happiest person alive. If you complain about heat, I'll smack you. I'm like, yeah, bathe in it. Like, I'll turn off AC. I want to feel hot. No, I like nothing more when, when hot leather sticks to my thighs in the car. I won't turn the AC on. I love it. I love it. I love it. Give me Palm Springs. Give me Phoenix. I love to feel that hot. I love it. So I, I picture Jesus spending time with God. I'm like, I get it. I get it. I, I understand why you would go to the wilderness to have this temptation. It was, it was beautiful. But, but he wasn't just in nature. He was also with who? Animals. This is a practical and simple thing. Foster intentional time with animals in your life. If you're listening to the podcast, if that means having to go to the zoo, whatever, there's something about animals. Our first assignment was to hang out with and give names to animals. 
God knows we need time with animals. Didn't Winston Churchill say this? He said, there is something about the outside of a horse that is good for the inside of a man. Wow. Now, we, of course, know now enough about that statement's truth to use animals in therapy. Yeah. There's something calming about it. I was thinking this week about Free Willy. I don't think I've ever cried harder <laughs> as a kid. And, and yeah, here's this kid in a foster home after foster home, trouble and shoplifting and bad friends and could really go a bad way. And it wasn't just the people. It was also that animal looking into that whale's sad, creepy eye. Are you kidding me? He's like, your fin's bent over. Mine is too, right? They helped each other. He helped Willie out, but Willie helped him out. I'm telling you, there, there's something about animals. All right, so, so in nature uh, and in motion, and then lastly, in silence, in silence. And this is really key, that we're minimizing inputs. And I'm all for reading the Bible. Duh, right? I'm, I'm all for worship music. Duh, right? And, 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 and yet, it's important, I think, to have times when there's no input coming in. Now, this is going to freak you out at first. If you haven't done it, it's weird. Why? Because a lot of us are like, we're with Anne Lamott. She said, my mind's like a bad neighborhood. I don't want to go in there alone, right? Some of us, we're disturbed to find out what's going to be in there if we ever get quiet. I don't want to be alone with my thoughts. That's what, that's what I definitely don't want that, right? I'll actually see what's in there. But to allow there to be silence in your day, it's so good for you. It's so good for your heart. It's so good for your your relationships. And when you, you, you'll then, you'll, you'll, you'll realize you need, you'll, you'll come from the silence back to the people. And not the digital people. They're there. They're going to be there. But we're going to come to real people, flesh and blood people who are going to be in our lives and care for us and, and pray for us. Do you, do you have Christian people in your life, Jesus followers, who you can just say, I'm really just sucking at everything right now. I need you to pray for me. I'm, I feel like I'm, 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 I'm at burnout. I'm not healthy. You need people in your life, and you need silence in your life. And we all need to be comparing notes together on what we're hearing in the silent, what we're hearing in the scriptures, and, and doing this life together. In motion, in silence, in nature. I like to combine the three. I always bring my dog with me on this walk and uh, that I take, my Jesus walk. And, and, and it's just it's, it's profound to, to see the dog and just to see him to me, always, him always looking up at me, his creepy eyes. And <laughs> Cute. He's amazing. He's a little poodle named Tabasco, and you know, it's, we just we just go out together and hang out with God, and it's it's just a it's a wonderful. It's, it's I'm just putting my cards on the table. This is this is why I'm still here. This is why 12 years in, I'm still here. Most pastors don't make it more than two years in a church. Jenny and I are here. We're here because of the rhythms that we put in place in our soul, and we want these for you as well. That's 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 it. I don't want anything from you. I I just hope that blesses you. Um, and, and let's end here. Let's end with, let's end with this thought. Uh, Paul could have supplied the illustration for this message. I could have preached this whole sermon just like I did on Paul. Because before Paul ever preached anywhere, guess what? He spent some time in the wilderness. You hear about him now, but it started in the wilderness. He did not go speak to people face to face. It was first a time of testing. Elijah. Yeah, we know all about Elijah's ministry. Mightiest of the Old Testament miracle working prophets. Not bad on a business card. Yeah. And yet, what did God send? He sent him to the, the, the brook Cherith, where he had time in the wilderness, fed by birds. <laughs> birds. You heard that right. Birds brought him food every day. He goes, go hang out there. How am I going to eat? There's no food out there. I'll, I'll take care of it. A bird every day, a couple times, showed up with the delivery. It was like Uber Eats, but old school. <laughs> I mean, he's like, what is this? And, uh, and, and so we could have talked about that wilderness time was responsible for this, the beautiful strength of character that was exhibited later on. I could have preached his whole sermon and used David as an illustration. Man, love his psalms. You know how he wrote them? He spent a decade in a cave while his father-in-law, the best thing that ever happened to him, the wilderness years. Wilderness was responsible for him being the sweet psalmist of Israel, the poet warrior king. It was those days in the wilderness. It was, that's why he later on was like, I got to go back to the wilderness. Got to intentionally foster the wilderness. When he didn't get that, it's when he was unhealthy and unwell and made bad decisions. When he wasn't putting himself back out there in that wilderness. We go crazy and we get pent up if we don't, if we don't get what we actually need. We'll look for it in unhealthy places. I could have preached this whole sermon using Moses as a backdrop. 40 years, 
in the middle of nowhere until one day he was present enough to see a bush on fire. When he was busy in Egypt, he might not ever have noticed the bush on fire. But it was when he was in the wilderness that he was present and engaged enough walking around with sheep in nature, alone, being silent, that he heard God saying, Moses, Moses. I could have used John the Baptist. John the Baptist shows up preaching everywhere. Everybody's coming out to hear him. Kings want to hear him. Poor people want to hear him. Roman soldiers want to hear him. Pharisees are mad at him, but they secretly want to hear him too. And when they show up, he's like, who told you you could come, you snakes? Dude was punk rock. Outfit choices, Prada, Gucci, none of these fashion shows had nothing on this cat, right? Hairy camel skin, like so current. That's so, oh, it's so, what a savage camel skin. Oh, camel skin. You see what Jay the Bee is wearing? Camel skin, right? Big leather bell. And he was a crunchy granola dude. He was eating locusts and honey. It's like, wow. And he didn't care about what you thought of him or anybody thought of him. He shows up, everybody's going out. Disciples said, Jesus, everybody's getting baptized by this guy. And how, how did he get groomed for greatness? Because he just showed up one day out of nowhere. Well, Luke's gospel tells us, chapter 1, verse 80. Mark's like, what? You made it to verse 80? I never wrote an 80-verse chapter in my life, right? He said, John chose to live in the lonely wilderness until the day came when he was to be displayed publicly to Israel. Problem with our generation is we're all trying to be publicly revealed to the world without first going to the wilderness. But God did it then, and he does it now. When he wants to make a man, when he wants to make a woman, he makes that man in the wilderness. Man made wilderness. That's how it started out. God didn't form Eve and Adam in the chaos of the city. He chose to do it in the solitude, in the, the beauty, in the perfection of a garden. And he's still doing it today. Sermon in a sentence, you can't have a quiet soul without quiet time. So let's fight for quiet time in our lives in Jesus' name.